want to say a special welcome to those of us who are here this morning. God has been good to us. Amen. 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 He has kept us safe. We are still alive. Amen. And I hope in our right minds. Amen. Amen. And if that's the case, that's enough reason to give him all the honor and all the glory. Amen. Amen. It is a privilege to be able to talk to God's children today. And then <clears throat> An additional blessing for me to be able to speak to us. And, uh, it's good. But well, we can come a while and rest. Amen. In Jesus, amen. amen. Yes. I want to remind us that the Bible, someone said that this book contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true and its decisions are immutable. Believe it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light and directly food to support you and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's shelter. Here, paradise is restored. Heaven opened. And the gates of heaven is closed. Christ is this grand object. Our good is designed. And the glory of God is said. It's your fill of mind, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Amen. Amen. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mind of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It has given you an eye life. will be opened in the judgment and be remembered forevermore. It is. The highest responsibility, amen? Yes. It condemns everyone who trifles with its sacred contents. I, I'm talking about the, the unadulterated, the indisputed, the undefeated, and still the world's bestseller, amen? amen? It is the Word of God. And I trust that as you open its sacred pages, that we will learn something that will draw us closer to Him, amen? amen. You know, the pagan Greeks. Uh, thought they discovered what was the high point, the epitaph, the ultimate of what love was, when the beautiful Alcestus was willing to die for her noble and handsome lover, Admetus. But when Paul came along, he said, that's not real love, because he said, he said in Romans 5, eh, but God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Admetus was willing to die for someone who was already lovely, someone who was handsome, who was, someone who was already attractive. But Jesus was willing to die for, for us because he knew what he was getting, something that was not desirable, unattractive, unlovely, but he creates beauty in what he desired, amen? amen? So all that we have, all that we possess, all that we become is because of the grace and mercy of the Almighty God. In that while we yet sinners, Christ died for us. Unattractive, unlovely, and he makes us the apple of his eye. Amen. Amen. God loves every single one of us. Amen. We are precious, we are important, and we are special to Jesus. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we have a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we come again to the throne of grace. Thanking you, Lord, for being so good to us. We ask, O Lord, that the Holy Spirit will be in this place. As we open your sacred pages, open our minds and give us understanding. Speak to me, through me, and for me. And may your truth be riveted into every fiber of our lives. It may elicit from us a response to be drawn closer to you. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. This we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a blessing it is to embrace the knowledge of Christ. Amen. Amen. What a privilege it is to know the God of the Bible. And it's, it is a privilege because many individuals have given their lives for this, for the preservation of this sacred word. Amen. 
Now Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 35 that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The words of God are, are as eternal as God himself. And that's why Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15, study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that he is not be ashamed. See, some people study to show themselves. But the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Amen? Yes. A workman that did not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth that he tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture, how many? All. all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The devil said to us in Psalm 119 and verse 105, Thy word, say to me, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And, and, and he said in verse 11, Thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. Psalm 119 and verse 9, he said, Word all shall a young man cleanse his way, but by taking heed according to thy word. Amen. And first, second Peter 1, 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were just the penmen. The Holy Spirit is the author of this book. The Bible is its own authority, amen? amen. It can stand on its own, amen? amen. So whenever we are standing, on the promises of God, we are on solid rock. We are the rock that will not be moved. The immovable rock, Christ Jesus, because he said to Peter, upon this rock pointing to himself, I will build my church. The church was not built upon Peter. The church was built upon Jesus Christ himself. And he said that the gates of hell shall not prevail Amen. against this church. This church will triumph. Amen. Amen. Yes. Ah, what a glorious day that's going to be. And that's why he tells us in 1 Peter 5, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, we have an adversary. The devil is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. So we got to be sober, we got to be vigilant. Yes. Amen. Amen. And by the way, the devil cannot hurt any one of God's children. He's just a roaring lion. Amen. And he cannot touch any one of God's children unless God gave him permission. And he can only go thus far. God loves every single one of us. Now for those of you who love titles, I've entitled the message. It takes a lot of faith to not be healed. And I decided to bring this message because it seems as though we are living in troublous times. And it seems as though uh, we are bombarded, we are buffeted by the winds of strife and uh, somehow people who get into the hospital today don't seem to come out. And by the grace of God we come back alive. Amen? And uh, we got to keep trusting in Jesus. But whatever comes, it takes a lot of faith to not be healed. You know, we love those bedtime stories, those success stories, those good stories. And we are told growing up as children, I did not grow up in the church, I grew up uh, out there in Hinduism and paganism and idol worship. I came to the Lord when I was a teenager, but I'm talking to you good folks. We grew up in a church and uh, within the boundaries of the church. We grew up hearing these good bedtime stories. If you're good, then blessings will follow you. But if you're bad, then you'll experience some hardship. And we tend to forget that all the disciples were martyred except for one who was John, who was banished on the Isle of Patmos and had labor, life imprisonment. And then Jesus met with him. First he was put in a, in a pot of, in a cauldron of boiling oil. And when then that didn't do it, they said, we, we can't kill this guy, we got to get rid of him. 
It's all in their GNC. They banish him, hard labor, life imprisonment. It takes a lot of faith to not be healed. Sometimes we tend to forget that the Apostle Paul wrote 40 books of the New Testament. Uh, made a request for healing. And uh, God said to him, My grace is sufficient for thee. And uh, God did not bring healing the way he wanted it. And he was uh, on his mission for the Lord, but he suffered shipwreck and martyrdom, and, and, and he suffered beating and, and persecution. And he, at one time he was in the Lamantine prison not far from Rome. And uh, the prison back then was not like we have today. The prison today is like a country club because I've been there in the prison for over 20 years. And I know what it's like being in the prison. You have three meals, you have a bed to sleep, you get to go to the rec yard, and uh, you can watch, uh, you have a computer room, you can learn a trade, you can get a little salary, and good behavior, you can shorten your time. But the prison back then, they just lift a cow and they will drop you in. He was in his own field. It was a subterranean cell not far from Rome. And uh, he said, I greet the folks in Caesar's palace. And he said, I'm sitting with Christ in heavenly places here to stay in his own field. All he heard was the cursing of inmates and the screeching of rats. And, and Paul said, I'm sitting with Christ in heavenly places. That was the heaven where Paul was in. And the only time he saw the light of day was one when they brought him something to eat. And he said, I greet the folks in Caesar's palace. How did any saints get into Caesar's palace? Because when they came to bring something for him to eat, he had something to say to them. It's not what happens in, to a man, it's what happens in a man. Amen. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We may not find God in the vini heal all the bumps and bruises in our lives, but it takes a, a lot of faith to not be healed, amen? amen? We forget these things sometimes. We forget that John the Baptist, whom Jesus said, there was not a one greater that was born among women. Amen. There was not a one greater than John the Baptist, not Eli, not Enoch who was translated, not Elijah, who went up in a chariot of fire was more noble or greater than John the Baptist, yet he perished alone in the dungeon. Jesus did not even pay him a visit. And he felt his courage. He felt alone. And he began to doubt. At our weakest moment, the devil comes to us and he taunts us with his greatest trials and temptations. Amen. To doubt the very existence, the providence, the protection of the Almighty God. And yet he lost his head. It takes a lot of faith to not be here. The same one who said, Behold the Lamb of God, now in question, is this the one or do we look for another? It takes a lot of faith, friend of mine. I turn your attention to Elijah, the one who was cutting uh, son of a prophet who was cutting the trees one day and his axe had a fell out of the river and he began to cry and he came to the man of God and said, what shall I do? The thing was the even man that was borrowed. And he said, take me to the spot and he had a little talk with Jesus and he, he let on his mantle and he touched the water and the Bible said that that axe had a, that axe head that was in the belly of the river came up on top of the water and it began to swim, amen? <laughs> if my God can cause iron to swim, there is nothing he can do, amen? amen. There is no problem too big or too small. But I turn your attention to Elisha, the one who Elisha met one day in, in, in 1 Kings chapter 19. He was in the farmland, plowing the land with 12 yoke of, of oxen. And he was instructed by God to place his mantle on him. And uh, Elijah decided to leave his livelihood, to leave his lifestyle. He kissed the 
his mother and his father, and from then on he followed the man of God. It came time when Elijah was going to be translated. And uh, he told Elijah, you need to go back. And Elijah said to Elijah, as long as I live, God forbid, I'm going to stay with you, amen. amen. And Elijah, Elijah said to Elijah, what would you have me to do? What do you want? You can ask anything what you want. What is your request? And it's amazing that Elisha said, he could have asked for anything. And he said, I want a double portion of what you got. <laughs> Amen, brother. A double portion of what I got? Can you imagine? Yeah. I want a double portion of what you got. A double portion of that power, that what you got. Mm -hmm. If you read the account of Elisha, he did twice as much miracles as did Elijah. He was the one who said to David, go wash in the Jordan. Just speak the word, amen. Right. Go wash in the Jordan and your flesh will come again to you as a little child. Oh, what faith? Oh, what power? But I want you to know, friend of mine, that Elisha made a request for healing. And healing didn't come. He didn't go to heaven in two chariots. As a matter of fact, he died after a long, lingering illness. His last miracle. There was a, a funeral procession. And there was a string of robberies in that area. And I could imagine the priest who was reading the, the Torah and the paid mourners who were there and, uh, and the poor bearers who were on their way to the burial ground. And uh, because there was the uh, robbers in that area, they, they decided to, to, to invade that funeral procession. And everybody began to run back to the city, to run back to town. Friend of mine, I want you to know that the poor bearers had a decision to make. Because they said, we need to get going because this fella is already there. And I'm sure that he won't mind because he's already dead. He won't mind if we just toss him somewhere. We need to get out of this place because the Moabites uh, were coming. So they decided to toss the body of this dead person, the corpse, and they managed to toss it into the very opening, the hole of Elisha. He was so godly that when the corpse Touch the bones of Elisha and just bring back to life. Now, in my imagination, can you imagine with me for the first time that this had ever happened? When the corpse sprang back to life and they saw this band of robbers, maybe it was the first time that the corpse or brand of Paul Bearers back to town. What a tremendous! But, 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 but Elisha was so godly that he did not receive healing, that his last miracle, that this individual sprang back to life. It takes a lot of faith, friend of mine, to not be healed. He was the one who, uh, when, they, when they began to mock him and he said, you know, that Eli Elijah had been translated, uh, some children from the village said, are you going up also, your wallet, are you going up? The Bible says that he had a little talk with the Lord and 42 she bears came out. Have you ever seen a she bear in rage? Oh. And they taught those kids. And the Bible tells us if Elijah had not, had not stepped, put his foot down and made a statement, his entire ministry would have been in difficulty for the rest of his life. But very early on in his ministry, he put his foot down made a statement that God is to be fair. Amen? Amen? God is sovereign. He alone is God. Beside him there is no other. No other. Yeah. Now, Hebrews 11 one tells us, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now, now that's the definition of what faith does. That's not really what faith is. If we can discover 
what the centurion told the heart when he made a request to Jesus for healing. If we can discover what he had, then we are found faith. Because Jesus said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel, because he said to Jesus, I am a man of authority. If I say to one go, he goes. If I say to another come, he comes. You are in the healing business. You don't need to come to my house, under my roof. You just speak the word. And Jesus said, if we can discover what he had, we have found faith. I have not seen so great faith. No, not in all Israel. We need to discover what he had. Amen? Yes. Faith. It takes a lot of faith to not be healed. And there are sometimes friends of mine who forget these things. That God needs these other gods. Philippians 1.29 says, For it is given to you in behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. The same book that we quote all these beautiful promises, says, it is a privilege to suffer for his sake. Paul says in Philippians 3, 10, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. So are you saying that there is fellowship in suffering? The Bible says that there is fellowship in suffering. As a matter of fact, it seems as though in the time of suffering, in our lowest moments in life, we are drawn closer to God. Someone said that in our good times, God whispers to us, but He shouts to us in our time of pain. Mm -hmm. And it seems that though that the only voice we can hear in the time of suffering is the voice of God. Because He never leaves us, nor forsakes us. Amen. God is always with us. He loves us, friend of mine. He loves every single one of us. I want to read a statement here from Prophet and Kings, page 174 and 175. It says, It is at the time of greatest weakness that Satan assails the soul with the fiercest temptations. It was thus that the hope to to prevail over the Son of God. It was thus that he hoped to prevail over the Son of God. For by this policy he had gained many victories over man. So with Elisha, he who had maintained his trust in Jehovah during the years of drought and famine, he who had stood undaunted before Ahab, he pointed a little finger at the king and said it's not going to rain for three and a half years. Can you imagine that? And then it disappeared. He who threw that trying day on Carmel had stood before the whole nation of Israel, the sole witness to the true God. In a moment of weakness, allowed the fear of death to overcome his faith in God. He who stood over 800 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, who called fire down from God and and the fire licked up the water and consumed the, the sacrifice and, and consumed the stones on the altar. Mm -hmm. A little woman said to him, where is he? Jezebel. They took, they took pitbulls, Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab was the worst king Israel ever had. And he who after got that mighty victory on Mount Carmel, he was threatened by Jezebel and he ran for his life. He felt discouraged. He felt like giving up. When we are compassed with doubt, perplexity and circumstances, or afflicted by poverty or dis distress, Satan seeks to shake our confidence in Jehovah. Jehovah is the great provider. Amen? Amen. He tends to shake our faith. It is then that he arrays before us our mistakes and tempts us to distrust God. He reminds us of our mistakes, our faults, and our flaws. To question his love, 
He hopes to discourage the soul and break our hold on God. When we are being buffeted by the wind of strife, when it seems as though we return the question, is God still in his throne? Yes. Yeah. And discouragement for of man comes to every single one of us. Yeah. To the best of us, we get discouraged. Despondency may shake the most heroic, faith, and weaken the most steadfast will. But God understands, and He still pities and loves. Amen? Amen. He reads the motives and the purposes of the heart to wait patiently to trust when everything looks dark. It is the lesson that the leaders in God's work need to learn. Heaven will not fail them in the day of adversity. Nothing is apparently more hope, more helpless, yet really more invincible than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on God. When we realize our nothingness, our helplessness, our weakness, that's the time we don't feel the pray. That's the time we don't feel to study the word. But that's the time. That's the time when Ellen White says, in our darkest hour, the blessings of God is closest to God's children. But we can't see him through the thick darkness. But let us never forget that God will never leave his children. Amen? Amen. We need that faith in this day and age. Yes. We need that faith. In this time, friend of man, God loves every single one of us. Amen. I want you to know that we serve a loving God. Amen. Amen. Right. These after ages tells us that not Enoch who was translated to heaven or Elijah who ascended in the chariot were greater or more nobler than John the Baptist who perished alone in the, in the dungeon. And of all the gifts heaven can bestow, fellowship with Christ in suffering is the most weighty gift and the highest honor. Suffering for Christ is the most weighty gift and the highest honor. It takes a lot of faith to not be healed. Because it might overlap in your life, and in my life, and in the life of our loved ones. There is a poem that goes like this, There is a peace that cometh after sorrow, Of hopes endured, surrendered not of hopes fulfilled, A peace that looketh not upon tomorrow, But calmly upon the tempest that is still, A peace that does not live, enjoys excesses, nor in the happy life of love secure, but in unfailing strength the heart possesses. <laughs> From conflicts won while learning to endure, a peace there is in sacrifice secluded, a life subdued in will and passion free. This not a peace that over Eden brooded, but at which triumph in Gethsemane. Oh. Thy will be done. It is not God's will that people suffer, but it is God's will that he has these other gods. Someone said that in a quiet crucible of your personal and private suffering, your noblest dreams are born and God's greatest gifts are given. It is not God's will that anybody suffer, but it is God's will that he has somebody that he can say, this is my child, amen. The story is told of a father and son. The father wanted a son to work in the family business. In the farm, and the son decided to go to college. And the father said to him, I'm not going to give you any funds for your college. Somehow he managed to go to college. And he had a little diary, and he wrote down, Two words in that little diary. And the two words were no funds. 
One summer he decided to come home to visit for the summer. And his father tended to discourage him. And he did not give the son any support. The son went back to college. <coughs>